So I have um, uploaded a, a complete version of the slides uh, for this segment uh, to Moodle. Uh, it's titled the same thing as the previous one, so don't be fooled, but it is new. Um, it has um, all the slides, and in that, it, the last two slides are an outline of the whole uh, PowerPoint, um, basically just a, an outline of everything we covered, um, so you can go and, and access that, look at that if you want to. Uh, we will cover it when I, uh, it'll be part of a summary and review when I, when I close this section. All right. How is everyone? You guys ready? Ready for this? Okay. Just, just a little bit more mind-bending spatial uh, stuff, and then we're going to move into uh, more functional carbohydrate chemistry. <clears throat> so, um, we defined the term chirality. Uh, and we've, been, we've spent a lecture and a half, really, trying to get the notion of chirality into your head, this non-superimposability of, of uh, atoms in space, uh, which give the carbohydrates their unique uh, characteristics, all right, which you are taking on faith as I tell you that it is an important aspect to understanding what carbohydrates are doing. Um, so... <clears throat> Uh, enantiomers are non-superimposable mirror images. All right. um, D-glucose has many chiral atoms, and so it's going to have a non-superimposable mirror image. We call it L-glucose. L-glucose. Uh, so here we see uh, both the Fisher projection on the left and the Hayworth projection on the right of uh, D-glucose um, reflected in a mirror on either side and we see that they are uh, the non-superimposable mirror images of one another. A and uh, alpha, uh, L and D-glucose. So D-glucose um, is the one that we find in nature. And uh, because of that, another name for specifically D-glucose, because when you just say glucose, really you're kind of being um, a little bit fuzzy in your language. Just saying glucose could mean uh, L-glucose. It could, if you had a, what's called a racemic mixture uh, of uh, glucose, it would be a mixture of equal parts L and, and D-glucose. That would only come, uh, that wouldn't come from biological sources. That would come from the chemical synthesis of glucose. Uh, you would uh, get a mixture of L and D glucose. If you have just D glucose, which is glucose that was obtained from, uh, much easier to obtain, but obtained from biological sources, uh, we, we also call that dextrose. And uh, many of you tasted dextrose in the lab, uh, the powder. All right. So one of the implications that this has is um, that although L and D glucose have the same melting point, the same boiling point, they have the same uh, freezing point depression in uh, dissolved in sugar, they have the same solubility, or dissolved in water, they have the same uh, solubility in water, uh, they, have, they have virtually identical physical and chemical properties. Enzymes um, are able to tell the difference between them. If I were to give you a, a beaker of L-glucose and D-glucose and have you run a bunch of experiments on them, outside of looking at their optical activity, you would have a very hard time dis determining the difference between them uh, based solely upon their physical or chemical properties. Um, however, uh, enzymes, an enzyme, for example, uh, that may recognize alpha-glucose, alpha-D-glucose. Uh, you can see depicted on the left uh, in this sort of cartoonish version of an enzyme that uh, glucose fits in there perfectly like a key into a lock. 
Uh, however, if you were to take L-glucose and try to fit it into the same thing, it's a non-superimposable mirror image. It is, is not uh, laid out in, um, in orthostatic Cartesian grid laid upon the universe. Uh, it's not laid out the same way. So it's not going to fit into uh, the uh, binding pocket of that enzyme. An enzyme is chiral. Uh, it, an enzyme has its own non-superimposable mirror image. Imagine this giant enzyme. It's not perfectly symmetrical uh, in all regards. You could uh, take a mirror image of it and then not superimpose it. Um, so enzymes, um, being chiral, can distinguish between chiral molecules. Uh, and here is an example. All right. This begs the question, why? Why is the universe like this, all right? So almost all sugars in nature are D sugars. Um, and to remind you where, uh, which of the carbons it is that we're talking about, uh, the, the, um, the stereochemistry that uh, gives the D designation, it's the one uh, labeled with the D there in uh, beta glucose that you see in the diagram. Um, Almost all sugars in nature are D. There are a few examples of some bizarre L sugars that are pr uh, produced by uh, bacterial uh, sources, but eukaryotic and above, uh, any kind of eukaryote or higher organism is going to make exclusively D sugars. I didn't talk about this problem when we were talking about the amino acids. Um, but it turns out that the absolute stereochemistry of all of the amino acids is L, about that central uh, alpha carbon. So remember, cast your minds back to the structure of amino acids. There was the uh, carboxylic acid. There was the alpha carbon in the chain that has the R group appended to it, and then there's the amine group. That alpha carbon that's in the middle that is a chiral center. There are four different groups uh, uh, disposed around that, except in, in glycine, which is the only non-chiral amino acid. Um, so here is a picture of alanine, uh, and you see that it's, it's L. Why? Whoa. How did this even happen? How did this happen? Because if I were to chemically make uh, alanine, I would get a mixture of the two. If I just took some chemicals and reacted them uh, somehow, I, I took maybe uh, acetaldehyde and ammonia and did some sort of chemical reaction or whatever, and I, and I got an alanine, um, it would be a mixture of L and D. And likewise, if I took two molecules of pyruvate and somehow chemically reacted them, uh, non-enzymatically made glucose, it would be a, a balanced 50-50 mixture of L and D. Why is it that life and all the, the organisms that uh, exist and all the food that we eat is made up of D sugars and L amino acids? That is a really profound question. Uh, it's the notion of symmetry breaking in this universe, and that's a, it's a deeper question than just uh, life here. How does uh, symmetry get broken in the universe? Um, they have uh, some... Hypotheses, one of them which is kind of interesting is there's this background radiation from outer space, quasars or pulsars or God, I don't know, I'm not an astrophysicist, but there's this light that comes uh, from outer space that is already circularly polarized because of the specifics of uh, the emission uh, source. And it is this highly energetic uh, this highly energetic um, radiation uh, that's polarized that caused a slight preference for the formation of one of the enantiomers over another back in the primordial days, in the soup, before there was life on Earth, when it was just a, a very simple chemical economy happening. That's one of them. There's, a, there's other hypotheses out there. Um, I'm, I, it's beyond the scope of this class to explore them, but I find it really fascinating, and, and I don't know if most people appreciate uh, that sort of bizarre aspect uh, to life on Earth. 
there could have been equally as likely uh, life on Earth with all L sugars and all D amino acids in this sort of bizarro, parallel, non-superimposable mirror image uh, universe. Uh, but this is what we have. And indeed, there may be life on another planet. It may be uh, completely carbon-based. They may be based on nucleic acids, and they have proteins and carbohydrates because uh, there are some really profound forces, uh, thermodynamic forces, uh, driving the organization of life along these certain chemical classifications. However, it, it may be based on L, sugars, and D amino acids. So there, there's something uh, a little bit nerdy to ponder as you stare at the stars uh, next, next warm evening you're outside. This, they call it the homo chirality. Homo chirality means the chirality uh, is all the same of <clears throat> all the sugars and uh, amino acids that uh, we use that we find on the earth. All right. So that's all I'm going to really talk about monosaccharides. I'm going to start moving into, we're going to build these structures up and start talking about uh, the functionalities. So um, if we take two monosaccharides, two simple sugars, and we're going to link them uh, in what's called a condensation reaction to form a disaccharide. Di meaning two saccharide sugar, a two sugar uh, chain. And uh, <clears throat> this we call it a condensation reaction because if you look at the two simple sugars, uh, the schematics I have of them there, uh, you'll notice that uh, the um, atoms highlighted in yellow is an OH group from a hydroxyl and then another proton from an adjacent hydroxyl on the other sugar those, uh, that hydroxyl OH and the hydrogen from the other hydroxyl group are going to get together and form water and take off. Uh, and leaving the, the uh, lone electron there to form a bond to the carbon on the adjacent sugar. We call this bond, this is normally an, an ether bridge, that type of uh, chemical uh, structure, carbon, oxygen, carbon is an ether. Uh, but here we're going to call it, uh, it's, it's a glycosidic linkage. Uh, it's a glycoside. Uh, so a glycosidic <laughs> linkage is a type of uh, bond that forms between two sugars uh, that uh, makes them into a, a single unit, all right? The glycosidic linkage. And specifically, this is a disaccharide, meaning there are two simple sugars linked up together. There are a lot of really important disaccharides. Uh, now we're going to be getting more and more into the, into the specific realm of food. All right. So here's an example. Uh, so I'm going to show you, um, I don't, I'm not going to need you to understand the, uh, the nuances of glycosidic linkages in all the structures we're going to see, although I'm going to put the, the identities up there. I will put the identities up so that you can, for those who want to follow it, they can. But a couple of them, a couple of the linkage structures are extremely important uh, because they, they help you interpret so much of everything else, okay? And uh, two of those linkages are, uh, the first of them is an alpha-1,4, glucose, alpha-1,4, glucose. Um, and so right here in the middle of the room, I have... Uh, anyone who's brave can go and grab one. I have two disaccharides. One of them is uh, alpha-1,4 uh, glycosidic linkage. <clears throat> anyone who can tell me which is which uh, after the next slide is, is, is welcome to uh, walk home with this apple that I plucked off my tree. Uh, it's delicious apple, really crunchy, tart, sweet, juicy, right there for anyone who's brave enough to claim it. All right, so let, let's let's look at what the alpha one four linkage really means. Um, we it's a dehydration reaction because this hydroxyl and this hydrogen are coming together and leaving. They're they're going off uh, on a honeymoon, and this oxygen is going to form uh, a a bridge between the two sugar uh, the the two sugar rings. 
We call this maltose. Uh, maltose is important because um, it's one of the primary sugars, for example, that, uh, that the yeast in, um, in the fermentation of alcohol, like beer, uh, likes to live on. So you have um, malted barley, uh, malted grains that uh, you're going to use. Um, so malted just means when a grain has been malted, it's been cooked, and the starch has been broken down into small chunks that are more easily digested by the yeast. Um, so, uh, for example, the brown rice syrup that uh, we used. Who used brown rice syrup in their kombucha? A couple of you did. You guys taste it? Who tasted that stuff? You didn't taste it? So good. It's one of the tastiest things out there, I think. Um, anyways, you'll have a chance. The, uh, that's, there's quite a bit of maltose in that. All right. Um, so let's, let's look at this. Oops. How come that's not working? This is supposed to be. Oh, I see. Right. It's over here. The link. Here it is. So let's look at maltose. Um, all right. So let me get, let's get us oriented. Here's the first glucose molecule, carbon 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6. This is carbon 1. It's the anomeric carbon, and it's alpha. Uh, this hydroxyl group is sticking down axially along the, along the axis of that ring. This is an alpha. Uh, so that's carbon 1, uh, the alpha, and it's linked to the next carbon chain. Here's the next one. This is glucose because all of these... Hydroxyls are equatorial, and this is carbon 1 because it's attached to two oxygens, carbon 1, 2, 3, 4. This is an alpha 1, 4 linkage. Alpha 1, 4 linkage. All right? You guys follow how I, I, I analyzed that? I looked at that? All right. No? Is anyone mystified by what they're looking at there? No? Yes? Maybe? There's a model of, of it right there. So let's, let's continue. There's the alpha-1,4 uh, glycosidic linkage. The next one uh, that is extremely important, this is probably the most common uh, linkage on the planet this is of, of any sort. This is the most common bond uh, between two uh, biomonomers is the beta-1,4 linkage. So again, we're going to take uh, two molecules of glucose, except this time they're both beta rather than alpha. Um, and we're going to have a dehydration between the hydroxyl and the other hydrogen. That dehydration, that condensation, that water is going to leave, and we're going to form a carbon-oxygen-carbon -carbon bond, this glycosidic linkage. All right. So... <clears throat> One of the reasons I'm pointing this out is that you and the vast majority of eukaryotes um, are a, produce enzymes uh, that can break down the alpha-1,4 linkage in the previous slide, the maltose, but they cannot break down the beta-1,4 uh, linkage. They cannot break down the beta-1,4 linkage. This is called, we call this cellobios. And it's, you may say, well, that kind of sucks because there's all this glucose out there that you just said it was the most common linkage, but our digestive systems can't break it down. That's a good thing. That's a good thing. Um, cellobios, this linkage, it finds itself, it, this is the disaccharide that makes up, uh, when it, it <coughs> forms longer chains, this makes up wood and a whole bunch of other types of fiber. So cellulose, for example, is made up of <coughs> long chains of this linkage. And, there's, and we'll see a number of other uh, larger polysaccharides that your body can't break down. Uh, they need, there needs to be uh, structural components to life on Earth that are resistant to easy uh, digestion. All right? So <coughs> um, let's, let's look at this. So now, yeah, so here, it, let's look at this sugar ring. Here's, uh, 
Here's glucose. It's glucose because these are all equatorial. All these hydroxyl groups are in the plane of the ring. Let's look at the plane of the ring. And you see that they're all reasonably within the plane of the ring. And these, whereas this, this, and this hydrogen are uh, axial along the axis of the ring. So this is, this is beta just by convention because the hydroxyl group is uh, equatorial. It's within, it's within the plane of the ring. Um, and then let's, let's look at this one here. This is beta. No, I'm sorry. This is alpha. Here's the plane of the ring. And uh, it's, it's glucose because all of these are equatorial except carbon-1. Except the carbon-1, the carbon that uh, has two bonds to oxygen. This, high, this oxygen is axial. See how that's axial instead of being equatorial in the plane? It's along the axis of the ring. So this one, this one, and this one are all on the axis of the ring. Don't be confused by this hydroxyl pointing down. It's this CO bond is equatorial. This CH, this CH, and this CO bond are all axial along the axis of the ring. So if I were to look down the barrel of the ring, I see, maybe this is a better way to see it, you see that this CH bond, this CH bond, and this CH bond are all right along the axis. If there was an axle and this was a wheel spinning, that axle would be right here, right? Coming, pointing out to you, and there, these are these bonds are all parallel to that, whereas all these others are perpendicular. So now, if we go back to beta and we look down the axis, here it's all hydrogens, and this CO bond is equatorial. You may not <clears throat> really understand immediately why that's that significant. Uh, it, I mean, I've been playing with these models for decades, and it, like, I, I still. Uh, come to appreciate things every time I screw around with them. Uh, but the enzymes, I talked about the enzyme's ability to recognize the three-dimensional structure of um, a molecule, the, the chi specific chirality of, of a sugar. Uh, having the, this kind of linkage where it's jutting out here rather than coming down here puts the plane of these two rings, so look at the, the relative plane of this ring, with respect to that ring, okay, and then compare that to what we have over here. So here's the plane of this ring versus that ring. They're, they're pretty <coughs> radically different. So the three-dimensional topology of this molecule in space is, oops, <laughs> really different uh, than the topology of this one in space. You following me? Still, still a little bit questioning what a alpha and beta difference is. Yeah. Okay. So here's beta, and this is the Hawthorne projection. This uh, hydroxyl group, you can just think of it being on this top side of the ring. So this is a beta. Again, this is beta because this hydroxyl, this C1 oxygen, which is attached to two oxygens, C1, this hydroxyl is on the top side of the ring, whereas on alpha, it's on the bottom side of the ring. They're both glucose because all everything else is the same here. Everything else is the same. So here's alpha glucose. Oops. And here's beta glucose. If you notice, these are all the same. It's just the C1, the, the relative stereochemistry about C1 is inverted. All right? They're non-superimposable mirror images just about that carbon. They're, stere they're enantiomers about that carbon. So beta uh, keeps it on the top side of the ring, and alpha is, oops, is on the bottom side of the ring. That's the only difference. That's the only difference between the two of them. But it has profound Im impacts upon two really common uh, sugars, two really common uh, structural motifs that are found throughout nature and throughout food. A lot of the properties that I'm going to talk about in different foods uh, that we're, that's coming in another couple lectures uh, is dependent upon very subtle uh, variations in the three-dimensional uh, structure of these molecules. Okay, 
So I know it, it's painful to learn a new language, but that's what you're learning here so that you can actually uh, appreciate some of the, these nuances in the foods that we're going to talk about. Yeah, go for it. There you go. Way to go, Nick. All right. So yeah, one of those is uh, cellobios, and one of those is maltose. And I would be pleased to have somebody tell me which is which. You can't pass the baton, hand it on. Or if you get it, let somebody else try. All right. Here are a couple other common uh, disaccharides. So everyone is familiar. Probably not many people have heard of cellobios or maltose before, even though they're as uh, common as they are. So maltose is the unit in starch. You eat cellobios uh, linkage every day in large quantities, and you also eat the cellobios linkage in large quantities every day. Maltose is part of starch. Cellobios is part of uh, insoluble fiber. All right. There are other common disaccharides that people are more familiar with. So, for example, sucrose. This is white table sugar uh, that you are all very familiar with, I'm sure. Um, this is a, a little bit more unusual in its structure, actually. Uh, this linkage is a... Uh, and a glucose, so here's glucose, uh, we have this, these equatorial hydroxyls, um, bottom, top, bottom. So this motif tells me it's glucose. And the fact that this hydroxyl is on the bottom side of the ring pointing down, that means it's an alpha. So this is an alpha gluc, uh, and uh, its, it's glycosidic linkage is from this carbon 1, so an alpha 1, and then it's attached to carbon-2 of a fructose ring. So fructose, uh, we've already seen the structure of fructose. Fructose is a keto sugar because the carbon with two bonds to oxygen is not at the end of the carbon chain. It's the second one in, so rather than an aldehyde, it's a ketone. And uh, this uh, fructose is a beta because the hydroxyl group is on the top side of the ring. Do you guys follow that. Don't be shy. If, if you don't, you're probably not the only one. Everybody's following me? Am I taking my time? Am I going at a reasonable pace? Why is it one to two? Um, why is it one to two? Meaning like biologically or explain how it's one to two? How? how? Okay, yeah. Um, so here, uh, remember when we learned how to count the carbons, um, in the aldoses, uh, this carbon is carbon 1. There's no other carbon attached to it sticking off this way. So carbon 1, carbon 2, 3, 4, 5, 6. Okay? And then here in fructose, this is the carbon that's attached to two oxygens, but it's, since it's a keto sugar, it's attached to two carbons as well. Whereas this uh, carbon in glucose is only attached to one carbon, and the other is a hydrogen up here. All right, so uh, the, by numbering convention down here in fructose, this carbon becomes carbon one, and then this carbon is carbon two, and then three, four, five, six. So there's a one two linkage. Um, there are I haven't I didn't want to get too deep into this to talk about what reducing and non-reducing sugars uh, means, uh, but. I will say that a reducing sugar is a sugar that can open and close. Remember I said when it forms a linkage, it cannot open and close uh, from the open ring to the close ring. But um, a reducing sugar can open and close. And that, um, so for example, um, like over here on the other side, we have lactose. Lactose is a beta, beta because this oxygen is on the top side of the ring, beta 1,4. This is carbon-4 in the other glucose, because here's carbon-1, 2, 3, 4. 1, 2, 3, 4. Um, it's a beta-1, one, 4 linkage. This anomeric carbon over here, the other beta-hydroxyl uh, group on the other end of glucose, this ring can open and close at will. That's a reducing end. 
that sugar can open and close uh, at will. Um, so that if you had lactose, uh, this is showing uh, beta gal. This is, this is galactose here, not glucose, because galactose um, has a hydroxyl pointing up rather than down. You'll notice in all these other, uh, this other glucose over here, the uh, hydroxyl is pointing down on the downside of the ring. But if, if we invert the stereochemistry there, it becomes galactose. Uh, if you leave lactose out, it's going to, the glucose on this end is going to go to a mixture of beta and, and alpha uh, sugars. But in fructose, that does not happen because uh, this ring in the, in the fructose cannot open, nor can the ring in the glucose open because it's there, uh, the acetal and the ketal are directly linked to one another. So sucrose is a particularly stable disaccharide. Um, okay. Uh, it's an alpha, one, two, beta uh, glycosidic linkage. Yeah, yeah, go for it. <clears throat> On the other hand, another common important disaccharide, oops, is milk sugar. So I'm going to talk a little bit about um, table sugar and milk sugar. I'm going to tell you some stories. I'll probably, hopefully, get through the table sugar story today, and then next time we'll talk about milk sugar uh, and tell you how that, that works. Um, all right, so uh, where's my, my pointer? My pointer's gone. Anyways, oh, there it is. Um, I see it on the screen, but I don't see it on my computer. Computer's catching up to me. Um, yeah, milk sugar is a gal beta-1-4 gluc linkage. And do you guys want to see what they look like? Should I, should I pull the models of them up? Let's, let's look at, oops, escape. Uh, my computer is having a hard time keeping up with me. All right, here we go. Here's sucrose. Bob, is there a way that you can have them both on the screen? Hmm, yeah, I think so. Um, fructose and, and lactose, sucrose and lactose are probably not the best ones to compare at the same time because there's not a lot of analogies, but I, I can do that. Uh, the better one to do at the same time would have been cellobios and maltose. All right. And what I, what I... What I probably should do is, is put some of these models embedded in a page in the Moodle so you guys can play around with it yourself. It, it really helps. Um, all right, so here is, here is the glucose. This is the glucose ring. Uh, I can tell for a number of reasons. Uh, I can tell because, let's get it. Come on. All right. I can tell because it's the Pirano ring, meaning there's six members, whereas over here in the other sugar, it's the Furano five-membered ring. That's the fructo. I can also tell because the carbon that's bonded to two oxygens, the carbon one, in this ring is attached to one carbon and one hydrogen, meaning it's an aldose. Uh, and we know that fructose is a ketose. So let's look over here at uh, the fructo ring. All right. Five-membered ring. Here's the carbon that is bonded to two oxygens, the ring oxygen and the glycosidic oxygen. This is going to be carbon two. And it is bonded to one, two carbons, which means it's a ketose. When, this, when fructose is by itself and it's an open chain, this is the carbon that has the carbonyl group, the double bond O on it. Whereas here it would be this carbon that is an aldehyde and has the double bond O on it. All right, so that's, that's sucrose. That's table sugar, the sweet stuff. Milk sugar... Um, has galactose one four linked? Oh, you wanted me to put them on the screen at the same time. Still, do you want me to do that? Yeah, sure. 
think I can do it. I can't get them in the same frame. I'm sorry about that. But I think I can get them on the screen at the same time at least. Okay, so let's see here. This is milk sugar, and let's look at the non uh, at the uh, the non-reducing end here. So we got the, the galactose right here, and then we'll get the glucose right next to it. And let's see what the glucose looks like. All right, so here's the glucose ring, and here's the galactose ring. Wow, how can I tell the difference between that? So you'll notice something about uh, you'll notice something about this that this ring here has been distorted. You're thinking to yourself, that doesn't really look like glucose because this is pointing down, this is pointing up, this is pointing down. That's weird to me. Well, it's because the ring has been, the ring uh, conformation has been flipped. And it, if you play with one of those and you start deforming the ring, uh, you can make some of these hydroxyls appear uh, to be axial and go into a different ring conformation. Uh, this is an aberration of the crystal packing forces that they use to get this structure. This is a crystal structure of, of sucrose. Um, but you'll notice, so let's go to the, um, how, am I, how do I want to pick that? You'll notice, however, that despite the fact that it seems like this, uh, so this is carbon one, two, three, four, despite the fact that it seems like this carbon is axial, it's on the bottom side of the ring, whereas here, in galactose, it's on the top side of the ring. So <clears throat> the conformation about this carbon is the same. This, this hydroxyl is on the top side of the ring, and this is on the top side of this ring as well. Bottom side of the ring for this, bottom side of the ring there. It's just the, the uh, configuration around C4 that's different between gal and gluck. All right, so here, gluck, it's on the bottom side of the ring, and on gal, it's on the top side of the ring. You guys follow that? More or less? Sort of? Yeah? <laughs> Am I depressing anybody with this? A little bit? Tiny bit? Okay. Um, well, I'm about to talk about sucrose, and, and I'm going to be honest, it, it's going to be a little more depressing because the history of sucrose is a, is a pretty grim history. Um, here, there's the sucrose molecule on the top, the gluc alpha-1,2 fructose. Um, that linkage can be hydrolyzed by um, an enzyme called sucrase. Uh, it's also called invertase or beta-fructosidase. These are different names that this enzyme has. This is the enzyme your body makes to break down the sugars in sucrose. Okay, so let's look at this process. Um, here is uh, the sucrase, and here's its substrate, uh, the, the sucrose, with the glucose and the fructose uh, rings. Uh, the substrate binds into the binding pocket, and water, uh, the water that we had released when we formed the disaccharide in the condensation reaction, is going to come in and hydrolyze. Hydrolyze, hydro water, lyse or lysis cut. All right, uh, it's going to cut it with water. It's going to hydrolyze it. Uh, so uh, the water comes in, and the enzyme facilitates the chemistry that uh, cleaves these two sugar rings, uh, the glycosidic bond that holds them. You can see the glycosidic bond right there um, in the spinning sucrose molecule. And then it releases glucose and fructose. All right, so that's... The, sucro, the sucrase uh, enzyme that 
your body makes that you use to break down uh, sucrose into fructose and glucose. Okay, so when you eat a, uh, a tablespoon of sugar just because you're a happy child, uh, this is the enzyme that, uh, that does the dirty work. All right, so <clears throat> table sugar, who doesn't love it? Everybody loves it. Um, it's got a long history. It's a long history. A lot of the history of uh, science often gets co-opted or told through the lens of uh, European history, but um, that, that's often overlooking a lot of uh, a lot of history uh, that has been contributed by the, the rest of the world. So uh, there are scholars who claim that they uh, first learned how to get sugar crystals, like the white table sugar crystals that we have in what's called the Gupta dynasty uh, that happened around the third century. Um, but uh, there have, um, there were references in India, so Gupta dynasty was in, was in India. Uh, there were references in India uh, to sugar. In fact, the word sugar is, uh, it comes from Sanskrit. But the earliest reference uh, can be found in the uh, Athvara Veda about 3,600 years ago. Uh, and that, um, this guy here, Shishruta Samhita, uh, listed 12 different varieties of sugar uh, that he had identified in, the, in 6,000 uh, BC. So, whew, long time ago. Uh, this guy, by the way, was a remarkable individual, Shishruta. I don't know if anyone has ever heard of him before. But uh, you probably have all heard of Hippocrates or whatever, the Hippocratic Oath. This guy was no less, probably significantly more amazing in his own right. He had developed um, the first, like, really comprehensive medical text. He came up with, he had, in his, that textbook, he identified 85 different ocular diseases uh, that he would treat. He, had, uh, he described over a dozen different surgical techniques. Uh, the year 600 B.C., he was removing cataracts. From people's eyes, Shishruta, you should know him because he was he is one of the great uh, the great minds that has walked the earth. <clears throat> All right, so there there's something interesting and uplifting about uh, white sugar, white table sugar, but there are a lot of very grim stories. Um, so much of this is not going to be new to you. Uh, Hopefully, but if it is, um, so I'm gonna I'm gonna focus just a little bit um, on on the story of the sugar production in the West Indies. Now I'm, I'm gonna do that um, mostly because I have spent quite a bit of time uh, investigating it personally uh, myself uh, down there, and so I'm gonna show you some pictures. It's gonna seem like you're you're taking uh, this is like a vacation slideshow. It wasn't that. I I was. Uh, this, this was when we were on sabbatical down there. But anyways, um, so sugar had been coming uh, west from uh, continental India for a long time after the Indians had learned how to crystallize it, right? And there was this, it, it commanded very high prices in European markets. Um, and so it was a lucrative uh, it was a, a lucrative trade. It was actually Alexander the Great that uh, first uh, came into contact with sugarcane and, and Indian sources of, of sugar and began to bring it uh, to Europe. But the problem was there wasn't really a good place in, in Europe to grow sugarcane. Europe is not a good place to grow sugarcane. Um, so there was this demand for cheap table sugar. People wanted it in Europe. Um, and it, it drove colonization uh, during the colonial period of, of European history. It drove the colonization of these tropical islands along the Caribbean. Um, and not just colonization, subjugation of the indigenous populations, uh, but um, they needed labor. They needed cheap labor, and so it was tied to the slave trade. Um, it was extremely labor-intensive growing sugarcane. It takes a lot of work getting out there and tending the fields, 
uh, isolating the sugar cane, uh, crushing the sugar cane, and producing the sugar. Uh, it's hot and humid. Has anyone been to the tropics before? Yeah, well, it, it, can, be, it can be really intense in the summertime. Um, so, <clears throat> yeah, it was harsh, inhumane work, and it, it drove the, the slave trade. So um, from West Africa uh, to begin with, and then uh, after uh, s slavery was abolished, or slavery was abolished, um, there was uh, effective slavery, indentured servitude, not, not just from uh, West Africa, but also from South uh, Asia, uh, the Philippines, um, and India, and China as well. I'm not going to go into that part of the story, but one of the podcasts talks a little bit about that chapter in sugar production uh, this week, so please listen to those podcasts. Um, I'm going to focus on this island here a little bit. Uh, I only have a few minutes left, five. Um, this is St. John's in the U.S. Virgin Islands. Uh, has anyone been here before? Um, it just, the island just got totally scrubbed by Hurricane Irma. Um, but I imagine a lot of the things I'm about to show you are still there because there are these giant piles of rock. Um, St. John is an interesting place because 65% uh, of the island is national park. All that green stuff you see there is the Virgin Islands National Park. Uh, and because it was uh, preserved as a national park, the, um, the evidence of the sugar industry and uh, the incredible infrastructure that's down there that was built on the backs of the slaves uh, is still intact. Um, so it's, it's certainly worth going and exploring and understanding uh, this chapter in American history. People can talk about uh, the slave trade in the United States and the South, uh, but a lot of that, you know, the growing of cotton, et cetera, uh, but a lot of that infrastructure has been destroyed. Uh, with the passage of time and development, but it's it's like a time capsule down there. It's a pretty uh, interesting place. So, um, yeah, this uh, slave trade required this production required huge numbers of of slaves to to work the crops, uh, to work the fields. And we see here a little uh, windmill in the back. These guys are probably Dutch. This guy here is probably Dutch uh, because they used wind power, and I'll, I'll talk about that in a moment. So <clears throat> the islands were heavily terraced with these rows of, of rocks. Uh, they would grow the sugar cane, harvest the sugar cane, but then they had to crush the sugar cane and extract uh, the juice from the sugar cane. And at first they did it with horses, so over here on the left, you see a horse mill uh, that was, was first built down there. But then uh, the Dutch um, innovated the use of a windmill uh, that would uh, crush the sugar cane. Because you know, the Netherlands is a windy place, and in fact, the, the uh, Caribbean is also. The prevailing trade winds, this windward passage along the north end of this island, this is really breezy going from uh, east to west right across there, an excellent place to uh, set up wind power. So the first place I'm going to show you is this thing here labeled number six on Trunk Bay. Uh, this is an example of one of their uh, wind mills um, that's down there. It's uh, the Dennis Bay Horse and Windmill out on Peace uh, Hill, now named Peace Hill after uh, its uh, uh, grimmer past. So this was part of the Susannaburg sugar plantation. And they would crush the cane juice up on a hill, up on these hills where there's a lot of wind uh, to, drive the, uh, to drive the windmill. Over here on this side, you see this open ring. Uh, that's where the, the horse mill eventually first was. Uh, but then they, they built a windmill. And so the sugar cane could run downward. They wouldn't have to truck it up uh, out of anything. They wanted it elevated so that it could flow down into the processing plant. Um, it eventually began to decline in the 19th century uh, as the advent of sugar extracted from sugar beets uh, came on. So by 1880, it was no longer grown uh, here. Um, and a lot of these uh, ruins, you can see here my kids climbing, these ruins are falling apart, but they were made out of coral that they uh, went, they just went out and cut huge blocks of coral, really destroying the coral. Uh, but uh, these 
Um, some of these edifices were incredible. Some of them are in better shape than others. Here's the Reef Bay Sugar Mill, uh, which is, is preserved quite well by the National Park. And then this is one that it w took it was really hard for me to find. Uh, there's very scant evidence. This is the Brown Bay Sugar Mill. Uh, there's hardly any reference anywhere uh, to this. And we had, me and my kids had to really uh, track through the jungle to get to this uh, thing. My daughter ended up stepping on a, on a uh, conch shell. I had to take her to the ER. So, <clears throat> yeah, I know it's almost time to go. It's one, one last slide here, actually talking about the chemistry of making sugar. So um, I'll just read this. Throughout the annual sugar crop time, December through May, workers often labored from sun up to sunset in the steamy hot, uh, boiling down cane juice to make crude brown sugar, muscovado, incoming cane juice from the horse mill or from the steam-operated cane crusher flowed first into the receiving copper beside the boiling bench. Potmen tempered the juice with caustic lime powder, skimmed off the impurities, and finally ladled off the cooling juice to the largest heated grand copper for boiling. This was nasty work. It's the jungle. It's the jungle. And they're boil, like over boiling caustic pots because they're adding lime. Uh, that if you get some of this stuff on yourself, it can actually be quite nasty. The process of boiling, tempering, skimming, and ladling continue along the line of copper to the last smallest one to teach uh, where the now rapidly boiling syrup thick into a hot liquid brown sukar. Now, at the master boiler's command, strike, fire soaked outside, instantly pulled the blazing wood from underneath the teach. Uh, at the same time, other, other pot room workers quickly laid a drainage gutter from the boiling bench across to the wooden sucre dripping trays. Finally, a uh, sweating laborer expertly labeled the steaming hot sugar mass from the teach into the gutter where it trickled and flowed to the waiting dripping trays. All right. I went a minute over. I apologize for that. I have like two more slides of this, and then we'll we'll get into the the lactose, the milk milk sugar story next time. All right. Any questions, comments, thoughts?